Welcome to Shelter in Solidarity, a deep dive with artists and activists during this COVID pandemic. I'm your, I'm host, your host, Joe Ramsey, live streaming with you here from Dorchester, Massachusetts, in what is our 21st episode, 21st weekly episode of Shelter in Solidarity, as we have run through this entire summer. And now we find ourselves in late August, a time which, especially for those who are in academia, uh, can be a very stressful and exhausting time whether we are faculty, staff, parents of students, students themselves. For all of us these days, this COVID pandemic has been a time of heightened stress and concern as individuals, as members of families, as workers. There's been no shortage of things to worry about, to stress about, whether we are directly affected by health concerns ourselves or we are more attuned to the economic, financial, political fallout of this ongoing pandemic crisis. For those of us who identify as activists and organizers and, and, so, and who in, in the course of that uh, take responsibility or attempt to take responsibility not only for our own immediate interests and needs but for the larger concerns facing our world and, and who are organizing or trying to find ways to change this world, the exhaustion can be doubled. The work is endless. The change we need is so profound and so huge, it sometimes can seem overwhelming. How do we sustain ourselves during such a period of protracted crisis when it seems on all fronts there's something to stress about, some more work to be done, nothing we ever do can quite seem like enough? And so in Shelter and Solidarity number 21, we turn to the theme of sustaining ourselves and each other through crisis times. This will be our third Shelter and Solidarity social hour, but we will actually have a couple guests to help us kick off this community discussion today. And introducing those two terrific guests is another terrific fellow, Tim Sheard, co-producer of Shelter and Solidarity, often behind the camera and on Shelter and Solidarity social hours, he's front and center. So Tim, it's great to see you again. How you holding up? Yeah, thank you so much, Joe. Yeah, I'm holding up. Thanks. I'm, I'm holding up. And uh, I'm lucky to have uh, as many friends and colleagues with the shelter and solidarity because this is also sustaining me as well. So it's, uh, it's, it's really great for me. So I want to introduce our guests for tonight and, um, and then we'll go into some, some conversation. Our first case is Michal Osterweil. Uh, she's a teacher at UNC Chapel Hill and she's in the Global Studies Department, and she's deeply committed to education for activists and for her community members. Uh, she's also a mother and a radical homemaker, so we're gonna learn some, learn some interesting things from her on that. And she'll be talking to, uh, to us this evening about some of the ways that she has learned and helped others learn to cope in these difficult times. Our second guest is Victor Naro, and Victor Naro is a long-term long and a well-known uh, activist and organizer with immigrant rights and with labor rights. Uh, he's out of the LA Labor Center, and he's also um, lead, a leader uh, and, a, and, a, and a teacher uh, for self-care and spirituality for activists. And he's gives, given many workshops uh, on the West Coast and other places on helping us sustain our spirit, keep our hope alive, and stay focused. So we're gonna, we're, we're very uh, lucky to have him here uh, with us this evening. And I'll start out with uh, Michal. If you would talk about what you've learned in this period uh, to, help, to help you uh, stay, to stay connected, to stay hopeful, uh, to stay calm, and how you've shared, uh, shared these lessons with, uh, with your family, friends, your community. Yes, well, first, thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and part of a community. I think that as much as I have learned, the, one of the primary lessons that I have learned in this time is that the individual is not a self-sustaining unit, right? And this is actually a call that we are, I think, being forced to, to confront in these very palpable and material ways, in some very uncomfortable ways. But also in our you know, social isolation, it is not true that we, we, I think we've learned the limits of that. And I think this culture has brought us to the limits of this myth of the individual. So um, it's one of the deep lessons. I wanted to just start actually by 
maybe practicing what I've learned. And I think that one of the most important things, and in the original language you all sent me an email was you asked about coping with the fear and anxiety. And I, I wanna take a look at the two words of cope and fear, but I wanted to start by inviting everyone here, if you feel comfortable, to get into a comfortable seat, actually. And if you can, rest your feet fully on the floor. If you're sitting upright, if you're cross-legged, then just make sure your sits bones are pretty flat on the floor and feel the floor beneath you, right? Feel that floor. It is the ground. It is here to hold you. And I recommend if you have your palms, there's a lot of different places you can make with your hands, but one really nice place to start is putting your palms on your thighs or on a table in front of you. So also they feel the support of something beneath it. And on your thighs, there's something really important that happens. And, and I've done some training on trauma work. And one of the things that helps us deal with the worst and the tra ongoing traumas that we have is our bodies, our bodies and feeling our body, right? So if you put your hands on your thighs, you can even sort of rub them, make like squeeze them, say hello to your body. And the lower part of our body is so important for staying connected, for staying grounded and so much of our time in this culture pre-COVID, I would say, but I think it's been exacerbated with all the time we're spending on Zoom and we're just like these disembodied heads, right? So really working to remind ourselves that our lower body is here. Our lower body is a resource for us. It helps to make us connected to the ground, to the earth, to, to you know, it's grounding. So just take a moment there and another nice place you can do, and you might, if you feel safe to close your eyes, you can also give your like arms a squeeze and just like feel your, you have a container, you are here. You can give yourself a lot of love and soothing and that goes a long way. And then just take some breaths. Breath is another very, very important tool that we have always. And when you are in fear or anxiety, you'll notice that your breath gets shorter and it tends to be up here. So really work to breathing from your belly, from your diaphragm, if you can. You can even put one of your palms on your belly. And another really nice place to have your other hand, so I like to put one hand on my heart and then one hand on my belly. So I breathe into my hand on my belly and I just feel my, like, supported here. And they've actually shown that you release oxytocin when you put your hand here. So just being here in your body is a really big part of what I would offer and what I do offer. And it's something you have to do over and over and over and over again, right? Because part of this period, which I have really, you know, I've been in, in tidal waves and then I have days where I just feel like, oh, this is, you know, this is what we needed. You know, the title, the great pause is what a lot of people have been saying. And I did not keep track of the time. So if anyone wants to like, just rein me in when you need to. Um, <laughs> the, this idea of this time of pause, right? And I think there is a myth that when you do spiritual work, right? When you take care of yourself, it's easy and it feels good. <laughs> and we do need to take care of ourselves and cope, right? We need to do that. We need to not fly off and lose our minds or just get overtaken by anxiety. But we need to do this in a balance with also gaining the capacity to be with the intense discomfort of this moment. We are being, to use the words of a someone I really respect, um, Pema Chodron, we are being nailed down to the now that we are in right now. We are being like held down. And there is a tension, I think, or a fine balance really, not necessarily a tension between self-care, which I think is really, really important, and I have some tips, I definitely do, and, you know, cultivating the capacity to be with the intense discomfort of this time, right? And sometimes self-care can veer into distraction. It can veer even into addiction. And so we really need to be, and, and the only person actually that can know that really is yourself, right? So this is something that you can't be judgmental of others. And sometimes you just need to binge watch Netflix. I'm not judging anybody. It's just on an inner plane, like what are you doing? And I've really been studying this notion of the difference between coping as a band-aid, which looks like distraction, which looks like addiction, which looks like feeding our habitual patterns that go unexamined, and coping as creating the capacity to be in the present moment, 
right? So we increase our capacity and sometimes it's just too much, right? Sometimes it is just too much. I haven't been able to listen to even my favorite news shows because they're playing the Republican National Convention. And every time I hear the quotes recently, I like literally like the fear, like all the nastiness, just, I just can't do it right now, you know? And I'm not trying to put my head in the sand, but I have to like take care of, and I want to say like our nervous systems is something we really all need to get familiar with, right? Our nervous systems have the capacity to, they've developed ideas about neuroplasticity. We can really transform ourselves and the world, but we need to do it in a tolerable way, in, in, in sort of trauma language, in the, the, the way I've been trained is in titration, right? You have to do just enough that you are be able to be present to, right? So um, yeah, I just wanted to start with that because I think that's really like, it's a tender time we're in. And I think what we're doing is really, if we meet this moment, and I'm not trying to put a silver, like I'm not trying to put rose colored glasses on it. This moment is intense, it is hard, it is painful, it is lots of things and people are suffering, right? And it is also true that the kind of transformation we might be able to achieve both in ourselves, but also at the collective level, I think are more transformative than in other times, precisely because we are being nailed down to the present in this particular way. And for me, my learning in spiritual and sort of like, like this work on the inner planes has been a lot more useful to me than my political analysis of late really and and but but translating between the two right i'm not i don't think of it as like inner self navel gazing work although there is a risk of that but really thinking of this moment like the revelations or the transformations that can come are more akin to that which emerges after a deep illness or deep depression or you know what many people that have a meditation practice like cultivate, right? Which is the capacity to have these insights by having the like fearlessness to look at the messy, painful, gnarled what is with compassion, right? With as little judgment as possible. Because so much of our work, I think, so much of the way we have dealt with things has an avoidance in it, right? And I said this quote, I repeat this quote often, this comes from a Nigerian uh, Bioko Malafe, who was actually quoting elders when he said this, but, you know, when times are urgent, let us go slow, right? The propensity is to think that when we are dealing with urgency, we got to get going, right? We got to go, we got to do. And I think what we are being sort of forced <laughs> into, not willingly, and I think this is how a lot of times this happens, right, is that we are not allowed to just go and do right? And so we need to slow down. And this is true both in ourselves and in our organizations, right? And this is, te this is, this is tricky. It's tricky, especially when people are dying. Police keep killing people. People are dying of COVID. Um, we have someone in intensive care. I think he finally got out. But it's like, you know, the world keeps coming at us. And yet we are trying to come at it from this different place. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Michal. That's beautiful words beautiful sentiments and thank you so much for the exercise i i i, I know i enjoyed it and and they're, they're very helpful um i think we're, we're going to come back to the themes that you raised several times this evening um I, I really appreciate your mentioning the social isolation that we're experiencing that we forget that we are part of a community we're sustained by our community and that's really what holds us and makes us uh, and and keeps us alive so I'm sure we'll return to that. And uh, I love what you said about being nailed to the now because we are so bombarded with news and emails and videos and Zoom meetings. And I agree, it's, it's so important to disconnect, uh, so important. So I'm sure we're gonna, we're gonna explore that more uh, this evening. But let's turn to Victor Narrow. And Victor, did what sort of uh, insights and um, advice have you been giving yourself as well as the, the people that you help? Thank you so much. And thank you, Tim. And uh, thank you, uh, Mikhail. I appreciate your words uh, just now. Um, and thank you for the exercise. I feel very grounded. So thank you for that. Um, I just think, uh, you know, um, maybe add more to what Mikhail um, just presented us with. But um, 
Let's go. I got the lead. There's a gardener in the mist right here. Sorry about the noise. It's okay. We can hear you just fine, Victor. Yeah. So can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Okay. Okay. So, um, so um, I just finished. Uh, I teach a. Uh, my work at the UCLA Labor Center, part of my work is teaching uh, our labor studies classes at UCLA. And this summer, I just finished teaching a class this summer on uh, spirituality, mindfulness, and social justice that I teach every summer. But this summer was very especially most important for the students because students are really going through a lot um, in the transition to Zoom learning. And a lot of my students are activists, so they're just struggling uh, uh, with a lot of the issues that a lot of my colleagues in the social justice movement, immigrant rights and labor movement are struggling with. And, and most of my work is with undocumented workers and undocumented immigrants. Uh, and there's a community that's been severely impacted because they don't even qualify for many of the benefits like unemployment insurance. Uh, so I've been dealing with their traumas on a daily basis, but um, what, what, I, uh, um, what I try to emphasize to my friends in the activist movement, uh, and this is from my experiences of having burned out, and especially in 2015 when I severely burned out, I ended up in the hospital, and that was really when I started to pivot my work and then really ground myself and try to ground my uh, activist friends more in the teachings of um, spiritualists and meditative practices, because we have to take care of ourselves in the process of taking care of others. Um, but, you know, one thing I always tell people is emotions matter. And you have to bring yourself fully, you have to be fully present in this work. And, and that means you have to bring yourself fully in the emotions as well. And you, you cannot disconnect from some emotions and embrace other emotions. So anger, stress, anxiety, um, these are emotions that happen every day in this work for justice. And part of it is, is how do you embrace these emotions in a way that's healthy, in a way that you embrace them, but you also embrace the other emotions that matter. Like we all have the capacity for compassion, for joy. Uh, activists have a deep level of empathy. How we tap into those at those critical moments that we're also creating an awareness of the anger and stress and anxiety that we're feeling. Um, so emotions, I, I see them as teachers, as messengers. And in the process of um, cultivating awareness of our emotions, we also have to know our triggers. And we all have triggers. I think everybody in this, even in Zoom space, can probably um, have uh, stories about triggers. And triggers are these issues that happened to us in our past, in our childhood or life experiences that come up over and over again as we're dealing with a, a, a situation of stress and anxiety like we're doing with today with COVID-19. Um, I mean, I was a, an abused child and child abuse is one of the triggers that many of us have. And so that comes up with me every day and in dealing with the trauma of the community of undocumented immigrants especially the harm on children, I, I, I get triggered with my childhood experience of being an abused child. So how, part of this is really how to know what your triggers are, embrace your triggers, and know how to manage your triggers. Know how to ground yourself in those situations when in dealing with other people's trauma, you develop your own trauma, you get triggered for something that has happened to you in the past. Um, know your triggers, cultivate awareness, of your emotions of the present situation. The Dalai Lama talks about the six angles to looking at a situation. So instead of looking at everything myopic, just linear one way, he says you can look at a particular situation at any moment, sideways, behind, top down, bottom up. There are six angles to looking at a situation. But this is part of the uh, process of cultivating awareness. And you're better able to deal with your emotions, especially with a situation of anger and stress and anxiety, which is very uh, heavy today and, and, and under the COVID-19 crisis and all the issues that are happening with black violence and other issues under this Trump administration. That you know, uh, really, uh, the more you can ground yourself in the present moment, live in a moment, 
um, better understand how your feelings, uh, you know, your emotions. As Mikhail uh, mentioned earlier, listening to your body. Your body is also a great messenger. Your body tells you when you are doing too much or you need to break, take a break or you need to relax or you need to disconnect. Um, and then also, um, you know, being kind to yourself. So we're good about, activists are good about giving compassion to others, but we've never been good about compassion to ourselves. And I think they have to go hand in hand in the process of taking care of others. You have to take care of yourself. And I think there's enough compassion inside of us. I mean, we are a wellspring of compassion. We flourish in compassion and we have a lot of love and compassion inside of us. So in the process of giving love and compassion to others, we have to bring those to ourselves, uh, love and compassion to ourselves, and they have to go hand in hand. Um, I, I think in activist work, we're very embedded in this concept of the martyr syndrome, where you sacrifice and you sacrifice for others and then you sacrifice more for others. Uh, we have to dismantle that syndrome, and I used to adhere to that syndrome. I was that 80 hours a week, uh, whether I was a lawyer or a, a director, I would always wear myself out, I wear my own staff. I was that person who was deeply rooted in a martyr syndrome, but then I realized after causing harm to myself and to those around me because of my overzealous passion to sacrifice myself, um, I, I realized that it's got to be a better way. And I think for me, it's the balance. As I give compassion to others, I'm also bringing compassion to myself. If I have stress for a moment of anger, how do you channel that in positive directions? But you don't do it by disconnecting. You do it by fully embracing the reality of what's before you. And then the final thing is common humanity. You know, the Dalai Lama teaches us about common humanity. Um, and that's where we find our interconnectedness for each other. It's, we're not doing this by ourselves. We, we, the, the work of social justice, the work of community base building, uplifting one another is about radical solidarity. And we're struggling, chances are others are struggling as well. And you know, just sharing the common humanity that this is heavy for all of us. And they were all in this together. So I do wanna end there, but I, 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 I do wanna thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Victor. You've, you've, you've brought so much to the table here uh, this evening. I, I, I can't thank you enough. And I, I, I appreciate that you've also echoed some of the sentiments that Michal has, uh, has talked about. Uh, she mentioned um, the, the old, the, um, the advice, uh, when things are very urgent, you need to go slow. And you're saying when, when things demand too much, you need to stop and treat yourself. And I know, um, as a nurse for 43 years, you know, nurses, we always put ourselves in the background and let other people take the glory. And, you know, we take a lot of abuse. Um, and it's, it's easy to get into this syndrome uh, as activists that we want to give, give, give. Um, one of the things I'd like you to comment on, if you would, and then I'll, I'll ask McCall to, to follow up, is that I found, uh, having been a, an activist for, I don't know, 50 years or so, that every once in a while, I'll get a, an email or a Facebook message from someone that we were working with in a struggle, a community grassroots organization or a labor struggle 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And they'll send my wife just got several of these from, from uh, people who are now adults that we, that we nurtured as young children uh, with summer programs that we sponsored and trips to the, to the, uh, to the, to the woods and, and so on. Uh, there's a lot of love that's exchanged in, this, in these struggles. You know, we make a lot of loving relationships. And I think sometimes we forget that people remember us uh, in this loving way. And I think I found that sustaining to know that, uh, that, that I, we, I touched them, they touched us. You know, we, we loved each other in, in the struggle. And um, so maybe you might talk a little bit about that and how, how that can also sustain us. Yeah, well, that's where my, uh, I follow the spirituality of Francis of Assisi. And Francis of Assisi for me was what I strive towards when you think in terms of non-judgmental, unconditional love for 
whatever is around you in your presence. And, um, you know, um, he epitomized love in action. And I think social justice work is love in action. And um, I think sometimes uh, when I work in spaces and different campaigns with my colleagues, you know, the word love, people kind of like, what, why are we bringing, you know, I just think love is part of social justice work and we have to embrace it. It's inside of us, it's around us. We can tap into it in the given, this the receiving. And if, you know, if, we, if, if love really happens in the work for activism, the giving and the receiving become one. And um, I'm part, of, part of my roots, uh, a little bit about me, I was born in Peru and my father comes from uh, the uh, Aguaruna uh, indigenous group in Northern Peru near Ecuador. And it's very communal living. It's a very communal group and it's about loving each other. You can be mad at somebody through love and kindness. You know, you, you can channel your anger as something through love. And, um, you know, um, you can embrace the worst situation, um, especially in an anniversary relationship to understand and compassion and love. And I think, uh, you know, in, in my indigenous culture, that's very sacred. And, you know, you um, insult, you, you really create a wrong if you don't embrace even a, a situation that causes you anger, embrace it with love. I mean, you, you shelter it with love. Um, and then, you know, I think it means also not just love of other persons, but love of the environment. So in, uh, in my uh, indigenous culture, like Mother Earth, it's like in August, it's the sacred month. Every day this month, we're celebrating our love of what connects us all, not just our interconnectedness, but also nature. And um, I do, you know, I'm not a camper. I grew up in New York City, but I, I do connect. Uh, deeply with my whatever, if it's a tree, you know, um, I, if, if it's an opportunity to go camping somewhere, to go hiking, I do connect and um, I love that connection with nature because I think part of it is our, our work on activism really relies on our ability to be connected, not just with each other, but with everything that Mother Earth has to offer us. And I think we often forget that. I think we sometimes too urbanized as a movement. So when we can get away, even if it's a park space, you know, there is a concept called grounding where you take out your shoes and just barefoot, have that connection with the grass, with Mother Earth, or even, um, you know, tree meditation. I, at UCLA campus, when I teach, I do tree meditation. And I notice this, people start to embrace it when they see me doing it in action, because there's, there's a connection there that we often take granted. Thank, thank you, Victor. I, I want to uh, continue with this theme about a nature, connected with nature. But before we do, I'd like to hear Michal, if you would comment a little bit, speak a little bit about uh, how you see friendships that we make in these struggles, how they sustain us and how they sometimes come back years later, surprisingly, and, and sort of warm our heart, especially when we're having a, a low moment and then we get a connection that we, we had forgotten we'd made. Sorry. You have to unmute. There you I, go. Fix me a second. Um, I mean, I think in some ways it is all about love, right? It is all about relationship. And I think that is what we have what we're learning in movements actually. And I think, you know, the beloved community that King spoke about and that so many others have sort of arrived at is like, is what this is all about. I will say that um, I, I am currently actually in, in a place where I don't, I don't have a lot of contact with people that I have worked with in, in these ways. And I've actually been missing that, feeling that absence rather than being able to like, feel into that. And I think, again, when I say one of the things I've learned is how profoundly important it is for us to dismantle our sense of ourselves as individuals, right? It is because it is all about love and love is relational, right? Love is about relationships. And I think it's about relationships on all the dimensions that Victor, that Victor named. And the, the myth that we are able to do it ourselves, right? Which I watch 
sort of with a lot of sadness and, and, and watch my students, you know, I, I, I was teaching a Maymaster course called Social Change in Times of Crisis, which was planned before COVID, but I, I teach this class every year. And, you know, my, the students really were grappling with the ways in which the things that have made them successful in this system, right, are the things that like, at the moment are like breaking their hearts in some ways and they're realizing like, wait, my overachieving success, all these things I've been trained to do, like this goes against my being able to connect to love in this particular way. And it's not the end, it's not too late by any means. It's like what we are learning. And I think, um, you know, love is also, there's so many ways of loving, right? There's like romantic love, there's friendship love, and there's also like love as spaciousness to allow others to be as they are. And I think this is something we are really called to do in this moment. And it is one of the ones that challenge me a lot. But this like, you know, when we like, when we can love ourselves and cultivate this, like through some of the, the meditation practice that Victor named, I think the loving kindness meditation is one of the most important things one can like do for oneself and for others, I think, but is to, to create a sense that, you know, we can hold all of it, you know, we can hold difference. Um, it's, it's truly a very, very, very important thing. And I think um, all the pain that a lot of people are experiencing right now, I think, you know, what, what do you have left? You have love, you have relationship. And I want to echo, I mean, in terms of practices, you know, there's a lot of meditation practices, but the body for me, like doing something every day that gets me in my body, I'm a very physical person. So we often know ourselves and like, I have to do something like that moves me even gets me, you know, like, like exercise. I'm not saying like work, you know, but also I try every day to be with nature. I mean, nature is, it's key. It's key. And I'm very privileged. I live not in a city and I get to like run a block and be in the woods. It's a very small piece of wood, but I, you know, I see owls and hawks and I, it just, it, I've noted that this has kept me sane. I don't know what I would have done if I wasn't in that place or in a place where I could access that. I, I love that we don't need a lot of nature, you know, we don't, we just need a little piece, but it's a truly vital thing. And I also think, I mean, one of the things that I've been reflecting on in this moment, this great pause is like, you know, climate change <laughs> is real. And we, like this pause I felt at the very beginning in particular was like, you know, maybe Mother Earth, maybe I don't know what, but saying just stop, y'all. Like, we need a pause. We need to stop flying the plane, stop the carbon, like, right? So it's, it's, um, it's a really important time to be with nature, also to remember that we need, we need it. We need it to sustain ourselves. We need it to sustain humanity. And we are on the precipice, right, of some pretty scary stuff with that respect, with respect to that, too. Yes, it's true. Well said. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's well said, Michal. And when the, when the shutdown really hit in China and Europe here, and people in some of the Chinese cities who hadn't seen the mountains in years could first see them, and people in American cities could look up and see the the night sky for the first time in years, it it's a shame that it that that hasn't lasted in the sense it hasn't hasn't created a, a revolution uh, of thinking and acting. Um, and uh, I hope you'll forgive me for uh, um, saying this, but um, sometimes that almost seems to me like we need an, a kind of spiritual movement uh, for, for climate, that people have to be one, like the great religious movements of the past, that really sweep people up and, uh, and bring them into a sense of, of joy and taking part and saving Mother Earth, as, as, um, as Victor referred to. Uh, you know, it's very, very common in, in uh, indigenous people's uh, mythologies and, and just lives. Um, so I think that's important. And uh, I want to call on Joe Ramsey in just a second. Um, but I, I, would, I would say even if people can in urban, uh, um, Victor mentioned that many activists are urban, urban dwellers. And even if you just plant a, herbs in a window box, and go to it once a day and rub your fingers on the herbs and smell them and, or, or put them as a garnish on your meal. Even that is a pe little piece of nature and it's very sustaining. It, it's very sustaining. Um, I, years ago, I visited the great redwoods uh, north of San Francisco and it was a, it was a, 
a moment I'll never forget. It was, it was, uh, a, you know, a deeply spiritual moment, very moving moment. And, and those are really important times, but I want to get back to a part, uh, something that you raised McCall that I think is important. If I can find my notes, ah, you've brought out again that we are a communal creature that we live with and through our community. And there's this American myth of the rugged individual, the dynamic entrepreneur, right? Uh, the heroic CEO who founds a business and becomes wealthy, Bezos with Amazon. And we have to fight those myths. And there's a reason those myths exist, right? That they, they support a particular legal and ethical and economic structure called capitalism. Um, and I think that, uh, uh, and I'm gonna ask Joe to comment on this, we have to not only fight against the myth of that we're all individuals, but we have to fight the myth of the myths of capitalism because I think they go together. But Joe, it, is, you're a lot smarter on this than I am. So if you may want to comment on that, uh, Joe. Well, I don't know about that, Tim. But uh, yeah, first off, before I say anything, I want to uh, recognize that we have quite a it looks like quite a rich group of people who are here on on the Zoom live, and this is a social hour. So we uh, we welcome your comments, your questions. It doesn't have to be. Uh, a question directed to uh, to a guest per se. I, I know this is a theme that we can all relate to in one way or another. So we just I just want to signal that no pressure. But if you want to, if you would like to speak, please indicate in the in the chat box, and we will call on you in approximately the order that you volunteer. So uh, you know we'll be doing that over the next hour or so. So I just want to let you know that. And if you're on uh, Facebook, we'll try to we'll try to uh, to get your questions there too from the threads. So, I mean, I had a lot of questions um, and comments listening to these two great uh, guests and, and your comments too, Tim. And uh, I mean, one thought I had, um, it's more, I mean, there's so, so many different ways we can go. I mean, my, my overall feel is, f feeling is that we're struggling even on the left, as well as in this society in particular, with the problem of cynicism, right? And in and, and a sense that, e that even those of us who think we have some sense of what many of the things that are wrong in the world, and maybe even as an idea or at least a word or a, some kind of vision, abstract as it may be, of the kind of world we'd like to see, you know, right? You know, people before profits and various human rights or basic needs met for all and various changes in our mode of production. Um, it's hard to believe in it. It's hard to believe that it's possible. Right, the, the, the tasks, and there can be seem to be such a gap between like the immediate reality as it's often experienced or understood and the change that's needed that we can, we can feel horribly inadequate if we make the mistake of looking at ourselves, you know, isolated or whatever as like the agent that has to do it all, right? But also I think there's a way that can even turn into something even nastier and outward directed, which is seeing other people as inadequate, right? Because, I mean, show me a person who steps, for, even if they step forward into a righteous position, you know, an NBA player who's going to refuse to take the floor or whoever, you know, uh, you know, any kind of person who's getting into political, social, transfor consciously transformative practice in some way. Show me the person that, that doesn't have baggage, that doesn't, that hasn't been touched by this, you know, increasingly totalized global capitalist imperialist system, right? I mean, you know, there's, there's no way to be pure within the system. So, and it's one thing to say that, you know, abstractly and be like, we shouldn't guilt each other because obviously we can't do it alone. But, but I think it's, it's deeply, I feel like there's this toxicity of the broader system can really get into the lifeblood of, um, you know, of the left itself. You know, sometimes I even, you know, and I think social, I wonder, so I'd like to hear, you know, uh, everyone's thoughts, but particularly Mikhail and, and Victor and, and Tim, your thoughts on, um, you know, social media, uh, on, the, on some of the concrete obstacles, like how do we navigate some of the concrete spaces that activism often takes place in? Uh, I understand you actually connected on Twitter, so obviously Twitter can be used for good, but I mean, do you, do you advocate stepping back from these spaces? Do you think there's a way to use these tools and model them differently? Um, I mean, that's one, there's a lot of, I also wanted to ask like how you think maybe the role of art, uh, the role that art can play in this. I mean, I'm, a, and write, writing as well as reading. I mean, I was, everyone, people may know Richard Wright, 
as the writer of harshly often, you know, realistic novels exposing the injustice of the world. But in his last years, when he was struck by illness, he turned to haiku. And here's one of the haiku he wrote. And so I wanted to hear your thoughts on writing and the role that literature might play uh, and art more broadly of various forms. He, Richard Wright wrote this haiku. I am nobody. A red sinking autumn sun took my name away. So, I mean, I'm a, I, I teach literature and poetry and, and, and prose writing as well in my, you know, when I'm not doing this, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on, I guess, basically the obstacles, the actual material obstacles, even in, in activist circles that can make these, uh, you know, this pursuit of a sustainable, loving activism for self and others so challenging? And also, what are the tools we have? I mean, you've given us some already, but I'd particularly love to hear your thoughts on anything that intersects with art, uh, art, writing, music, perhaps, things that you think can help people uh, work through this, these challenges. I'll go, I'll start. I mean, but stop me because I just go. So, okay. So first, I just want to say you started with cynicism and I, there's a really beautiful quote that I've, I mean, I've remembered this from, I think high school, I don't know, maybe middle school um, by Kurt Vonnegut, who says, for what is a more, what is a cynic after all, but a moralist at heart who laughs at the world so as not to cry, you know? And I think I, I love the work of someone named Joanna Macy who does this work called The Work That Reconnects. And she is in her, I think she just turned 90, and she is a Buddhist and a scientist. But one of the things she talks about is the fact that so much energy is spent deadening our hearts, right? There was like a lot of talk about apathy, but really pathos, right? If we look at the root, it's an attempt to keep your heart because we're trying to protect our hearts. And one of the things that I think we have to do right now, and if we want to later, there's a beautiful actually meditation that I brought with me in case we wanted to do this about like the heart that breaks open can hold the whole world, right? The kinds of falling apart that can happen when you actually let the grief in, actually feel it, right? We spend so much time avoiding it. And I think activists, right? And I mean, biographically, I can just say like, I used to be a gung-ho social justice activist and I was working and I was also studying them. I was an anthropologist, an activist researcher, we called ourselves. And one of the things that happened to me was being burnt out, not necessarily by my own, but by the toxicity of the spaces, right? Like this was a very troubling thing. But one of the things I also discovered was that a lot of people were feeling that and they were finding new spaces is, right, to do what people were calling spiritual activism, healing justice. These emerged in the 2000s, late 90s, 2000s in the United States that were really addressing the fact that many of the ways that activists pursue justice are reproducing capitalist culture, right, in its egocentrism. Ego is a big one. Ego is a huge one. And a lot of it is because we're not aware of that. And a lot of activists are, are products of a lot of pain. Right. And sometimes it's easier to be angry at the outside than to, to deal with what is going on on the inside. And what we, you know, we, um, Victor brought up triggers and trauma. We are in a profoundly traumatized society and I am someone with relative privilege. Right. There's much more out there. And so a lot of the work we have to do right now, I think, is calling on us to, you know, like get into that messier place of being with the grief, being with the pain, but knowing that on the other side of that, right? Like the heart that breaks open can hold the whole world. There is something so beautiful and profound. Um, I will just say in terms of art and in particular, yes, <laughs> I think, um, you know, one of the things that, and, and I spoke about this last time you and I spoke, but one of the things that this is a moment for is decentering the mind, or rather putting the mind at the service of the heart, right? And the imagination. And I think Western culture, which is, you know, the capitalist, the source of capitalism, right? The, onto, uh, the ontology and epistemology of the, you know, rational, Cartesian, individual, all these things go together, right? is at the heart of so much of what we are doing. And activists are good modern subjects. We are good rational modern subjects and we like to be in control and pursuit of justice and decentering ourselves and letting go of our mind's control a little bit and getting into that sort of more messy place of the heart, which I think 
art does for us like that and poetry does for us like that right like it isn't it isn't a product of a rational argument <laughs> it's the product of something moving you yeah so i think um absolutely and just one of the things that i joanna Mazur wrote this book called active hope how to face the mess within we're in without going crazy and i really really recommend it it has a lot of practices in it too but it also it's written way before COVID, way before. It's more about climate um, and environmental issues. But one of the things that I really hold on to is that, you know, sometimes when we try to change the world, that's where cynicism and like, because the, the world that we have is that which we have, right? We have to open our minds up to what we don't know about yet, the unknowable, right? And so the Zapatistas say, you know, to change this world, that's impossible. Let's build new worlds. Right? And when you build something together, when you have the possibility of using your imagination to create, right? It's, the cynicism isn't as, as daunting, right? Because it's not about getting so-and-so to believe you. It's about like manifesting, right? In this world, I mean, the idea of putting the herbs in your food, like I'm, I'm an avid gardener and try to cook a lot of what I grow and having the pause has helped my garden do a lot better this year, um, right? But there's something about doing and making and feeling your capacity to be in charge of your life and sustain yourself even very materially, like with the food you consume, right? And not to be dependent on these like, you know, process, but even having to go elsewhere for other things. And again, this is not about becoming an individual, you know, it's a different thing. It's about a self-sustaining, but that is, has to be collective and communal. We've been a little all over the place with that, but that's a really, you brought up some really points that I care deeply about. Thank you so much, Macau. Someday, before I die, I've got to write a paper that Descartes was the father of neoliberal ideology. So I, you know, I'm glad you raised that because it's really true. He was a foundational thinker on it's all about me. And he was totally wrong. His philosophy is junk. But anyway, um, I'd like to hear, Victor, if you have any more comments on, on, yeah. on art <laughs> on, or um, any, any, of the, any of the arts at all that sustaining, yeah. sustain our spirit. And then I want to open up to some, some of our uh, participants. Okay. So as to the first part of the question uh, from Joseph, um, you know, it's a good example of, I think, activists, uh, we have the deep capacity to find the opportunity in any crisis before us. And I think that's why we create that kind of awareness of looking at the crisis, the real reality before us, we can tap into the ability to be uh, able to find the opportunity. And just to give an example, like I work with undocumented workers. And right now, uh, for example, right today I was in the California assembly virtually because I've been working on this legislation to uh, get rid of the peace rate system in the government industry because that that has created horrible working conditions for workers, that whole peace rate system. And uh, government workers, we, tr you know, I work with the government, my, my colleagues at the Government Workers Center and other organizations that work with government workers, we, we actually are able to have government workers join in delegation visits to legislators by Zoom. It, these are, they will not be able to do that because uh, they will not be able to drive all the way up to Sacramento from Los Angeles to participate. But in, uh, in the past few weeks, they've actually been able to tell their powerful stories to legislative uh, staff or lawmakers in Zoom about why they need this legislation. So that, and that's been very uplifting and powerful leadership development that they've been encountering. They will not have been able to do that um, pre-COVID-19, because they would not be able to make the trip up to Sacramento. And uh, I, I've been seeing these kind of spaces where community members are disconnected in many ways because they deal with so much of the suffering today, are able to bring their voices into powerful spaces to influence lawmakers and other elected and government officials in, in, in ways that are very powerful. So I think that's another, that's another example of how we've been able to find the opportunity to make those meaningful connections in this crisis. Um, as far as, uh, um, you know, art, you know, art was very de depressed, suppressed in my household. My father never let me explore music or art because he felt like that wasn't good for me. So that was part of my childhood. But it's made me come to really appreciate the fact that I think we're all creative inside, that human being is a creative, we're all born to be creative and 
I think it's social justice work. I think this is the more we connect with the arts, whether it be music, poetry, art, you know, drawing, uh, anything that's uh, anything that requires the taps into creativity, we become stronger activists and we become more creative activists. And I do mixed media art. You know, I think art, I've come to realize that art is not the inner critic, you know, because I used to, I think I, it was so suppressed when I grew up, I felt like art was only for a handful of people, musician was only for a handful of people, and I was not one of those, but I think we're all musicians and we're all artists, and we can all be poets if we believe in ourselves, and, you know, I think I do a lot of journal writing meditation. It's a great uplifting way to do writing meditation because you tap into your what's inside of you, you're in the wisdom when you do write in meditation and you come up with such beautiful passages that's inside of you. So I just think art is for the 99%. And I think we need to dismantle this capitalistic framework of art and artists, thinking it's only for that few percent and the majority don't have the ability to do that. I think we're all artists and poets and musicians. Thank you so much, Victor. Thank you. Beautifully said. Uh, we have some uh, people who are taking part who would like to um, raise a question or a comment. I want to start with Sunny. Sunny, if you could unmute your microphone, and uh, I'd like to hear your comment or question for uh, for everyone. All right. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, I'm Sunny, and uh, thank you all for hosting this. I think this is really informative and interesting, um, and definitely needed in these times. Uh, I definitely agree with the comments about art. I think art is incredibly important. But what I wanted to bring up, I guess, is I noticed, um, especially in the beginning, a sort of emphasis on mindfulness and grounding. And I think that can be extremely helpful for a lot of people. I, I just wanted to raise a, just another viewpoint. Um, like, as somebody who has like a, this might be too much information, but as someone who has a, a major dissociative disorder, I've noticed that sometimes things like mindfulness or grounding can at times make things worse, depersonalization, derealization. So I think, and again, these things can really help a lot of people, but I think it's okay if it doesn't help you or if it makes things worse. I think it's okay to say certain things might not work for everyone and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing it wrong. It just means everybody's different and not to say like everybody not to say that certain things can't help a lot of people, because they certainly can, but um, I think it's also good to just raise awareness that not everything is for everyone, and that certain things can even be harmful to certain people, and that if you are one of those people, it, it's not necessarily because you're doing it wrong or it's your fault, which is something that I felt for a while, um, but you might just need to find a different approach. So I think finding different ways to deal with certain things, different ways to connect to your environment and to other people and to help yourself uh, and just exploring those ways with people similar to yourself can be really helpful, even if it's not necessarily what everyone else says might help. Thank you so much, Sunny. I think your, your words of wisdom from one so young, uh, and I know we really appreciate what you have to say. Um, we're not all the same, uh, and we respond differently uh, to the same issue, the same. Um, so I, I appreciate what you're saying, and, and uh, we, I'm certainly I will take it to heart, and I try and remember, you know, if any of us who have ever assumed a leadership position in any organization, one of the things I learned very late is that people are, have very different ways of responding to to your leadership or to uh, a conflict or to a challenge. And there's a lot of variety and you have to treat them differently because they respond differently. And uh, it's a hard lesson. Anyway, I see that Nicole has a question. So we're going to open up to Nicole. If you would be so kind to raise your comment or question, and then I'm going to go to Kira. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm in the dark here. We lost power like an hour ago. So I'm just huddled by the window. But um, <laughs> My question is, I'm wondering if anyone has some general general advice for parents at this moment. I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old, and um, you know, my four-year-old was supposed to start preschool next week, and he's not going to because of COVID, and um, they haven't seen their friends since March, and I'm just constantly worried about their social development, and also just figuring out how to raise them to be good people um, with everything happening in the country. So. 
if anyone has any advice on just the daily stress of parenting right now, I'd be, I'd love to hear it. Thank you so much, Nicole. Now I'm a grandparent, so I'm not the best person to talk, but uh, does anyone like to volunteer any suggestions for Nicole? And if not, then I'll, then I'll, I'll, I'll make a comment or two. Victor? I'm so sorry, Nicole, where, where are you located? You said you lost the power, where are you? I'm not, I'm not by a, I'm not by hurricane, thank goodness. I'm in Pittsburgh, it's just a storm. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I hope that you will get your power soon. Thank you. Does someone have uh, any suggestions for, uh, for um, Nicole's question about parenting? I mean, I will just say I have a, I have a three and a half year old and well, actually she's gonna be four in a month, so closer to four, but um, it has been a trying time for us parents for sure. And I would say partly for you, have a lot of self-compassion, right? Have a lot of spaciousness around it. And what I would say about school and nursery, I think that one of the challenges is making sure that there is some kind of connection with other people and hopefully other children. But school, you know, like I think using this time sort of to reconnect with like your playful side and sort of like there's a lot of talk, at least in worlds that I'm interested in, is in de schooling, right? And part of the Cartesian subject that we are all products of, I think, in this room, at least to a certain extent is a product of schooling, right? So like, I keep trying to find what is the, like, what is the invitation for a curiosity and exploration that might yield something, right, beneficial. And I will say that I have the, like, I have gone to the edge of my tolerance for everything with parenting. So I am not judging or anything about that. Like, it's, it's one of the hardest things right now. At the same time, it is because of my child that I have gone to a pond and went swimming, like, almost all summer. Like, I, going outside finding ways for the child to be like just taken up by wonder in the world is what you know especially at the two and four year old i think is a really really important thing and there's a lot that can be gained by like taking advantage of the lack of structure right because they're going to be schooled from the day they're five or whatever for all of their lives for most of us right so there's something to be said about this moment of non-structure that might be that might have some like sort of hidden gifts i would also say you know like you have to be realistic and just be like set good goals but don't like be too harsh on yourself but about like what are you can't or can't achieve um i i am one thing i am i will say out loud i am very concerned about screen time for children and something that i i know a lot of my friends decided not to send their kids to school even though they could have is because it was gonna be all online and they just didn't want their kids to be on Zoom all the time. And um, I think we, we do have to be really cautious about that. And sometimes you gotta put an audiobook on or a story on because you <laughs> need to take care of yourself too. I don't know if that's helpful. And thank you, Michal. And just to add to that, Nicole, I know my son has, uh, has two young children and he set up a school for them at home. But one of the things, since you're in Pittsburgh, I know you have a number of parks, you have river walks and bridges. And I wonder if it, if it's, it seems to me it would be safe for you to have play dates with other children and parents, and you made it into a scavenger hunt, where, for example, you gave them pictures of specific flowers or trees or animals or grasses and asked them to find them. I mean, it seems to me it would be safe, even in COVID, to, to have a small group of children and parents that are socially distanced, but that are working together. I, I think there's, there are possibilities for communal activity where you could, where, you know, you could, where the child can socialize and also it can be learning experience. So it seems to me you could explore something like that. My son has had some good results for that with his children. Um, he's in New Zealand, so he has an, like an optimal, but they were locked down for quite a while. And, um, uh, he was able to, to get out to some of the parks uh, with other children, and uh, it worked out very well. That's a great idea. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to uh, ask Kira if you have any questions or comments uh, for our uh, about for our guests or or just for yourself. 
Yeah, I actually have a, a big question since both of our speak actually most of our speakers are from like university campuses as well. Um, I'm currently in central New York and one of the schools has just reopened. So of course all the college students are flooding everywhere. And for people in our neighborhood, it's, it's a bit of a shock given if some of them manage to wear masks. And I'm wondering how do you guys balance the amount of looking for public space and looking for spaces to connect even with people who might have not been in your pod before or something. Like I moved back from a very different place and I'm getting to know people again in my neighborhood, but that was built after COVID. Victor, you have a thought? Yeah, so I, um, you know, one of my, my work is uh, running the uh, community-based center in you know, downtown LA. Um, it's a center for workers and immigrants and that's been shut down since. We shut down our center in February and we we kind of remotely. So we've been trying to figure out what can substitute for that kind of space. And, you know, what we're trying to do is, um, we're trying to figure out um, how to connect either Zoom or Google Hangouts. Um, I also use Slack with some of my students, so we we prefer Slack. We don't we don't want to be looking at a screen for a long time either. So, um, but we're trying to figure out how to build community using these spaces like Slack, uh, Google Hangouts, and Zoom, and and we're trying to use you know one thing we we are finding in the work for justice in Los Angeles is what we used to take for granted, you know, we used to take these meeting spaces for granted. We used to take for granted uh, being in each other's presence. Now we're realizing how uh, much we should cherish uh, meaningful interconnectedness. And I think we're actually really redefining solidarity. I think solidarity, we're giving it a deeper uh, depth of um, awareness than we ever have. And I think we're gonna come out, out of this once we're able to go back to what considered physical spaces, we're going to have a deeper sense of, I think, solidarity and interconnectedness. But we're trying different things. You know, we have our Zoom circles sometimes with different uh, teams working on different campaigns. I find with working with a lot of workers, I'm more connected with the workers now than ever before because it's easier not to bring workers together from different places through Zoom versus, versus if, if we were trying to trying to get to a destination in Los Angeles where all the traffic and everything, it usually meant a lot of people not being able to show up to a particular location, whereas now it's easier to show up by Zoom. And so I'm finding like there's a deeper participation now. We're doing this correctly with a lot of the workers who I'm trying to uh, help in different campaigns. And so I, I get a better chance now to get to know them deeper and know their families deeper. And then they, get, I, they have a better opportunity to know me as well versus what we had, uh, you know, the struggle to get to a physical space, beat the traffic, get there on time. Sometimes you're gonna get there late. So, so I think there's a lot of uh, good opportunities to create deeper connection and deeper solidarity um, with, with what we have before us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Victor. Um, but go, getting back to Nicole, um, I had another thought for you and for parents in general. I know that uh, in, in cities and towns, there are outdoor murals, some graffiti, statues, uh, interesting architectural buildings. And it seems to me it wouldn't be that tough giving social media to organize a walking tour uh, of your city's outdoor art, uh, your city's outdoor places. Uh, it could even be historical. And you, it seems to me parents and children could engage in uh, safe distancing, walking tours, uh, just uh, as you might have with a, with a treasure hunt. And that could be educational, could be fun. And one thing I've learned from my son is they have to end up at an ice cream shop, right? You have to promise children a reward. Um, so tell them, we're going to spend a half hour looking at art, and then we're going to get ice cream. Then we're going to have spend a half hour looking at statues. Then we're going to get cake. 
Um, and as long as you hold that reward out in front of them, they'll be pretty tolerant of the didactic portion of your day. Uh, so that's just a, a, another thought um, I, I have for you. Uh, Joe, you have a comment or a question uh, for us? Yeah, sure. First off, I just want to give uh, Mikhail a, a shout out. I've stood up. I realized I was kind of like, the seat I usually do the show on is doesn't really allow me to anchor very well. So, so I'm, I'm actually, I moved. So I'm standing up so you can see the top of Che's head now. But um, I wanted to uh, make a brief comment, but really welcome Victor um, and Mikhail. I think Victor actually offered us this particular formulation that I'm going to pick up on and kind of bounce back. But actually, I'd really love it if other people on this Zoom wanted to step into it as well. And this is the idea of realizing that there can be opportunity latent or, you know, potentially, you know, uh, available even in a moment or maybe especially in moments of crisis. Right. And, and just while people, I would love to hear, you know, maybe some so further reflections on that, or maybe concrete examples, I think that often helps the story form, you know, it's not just the concept, just, just to give you a moment, I'll just share one small crisis into opportunity moment that, that we've mentioned on the show before, but other people may not have heard it, which is how the show formed. The show formed basically when one of the first days that, um, COVID was really hitting and workers were being sent home in some cases. And one of the groups of workers that was sent home in, in large numbers were the, the, apparently the Facebook employees. And so I don't know if you all remember, uh, but there was Facebook just started going haywire. Like anything that people posted on Facebook, at first people thought it was just highly political things that were being censored and zapped off. But it turned out it was everything, like even people posting things about apple trees and you know, their nephews were getting, and the whole, you know, so it was just like, it was this moment when we suddenly realized many of us who spend perhaps too much time on such a platform anyway, like, wow, like, what if this really did go down, either for technical reasons or for more nefarious political reasons, as, as actually does happen to certain groups and certain political persuasions, right? The people getting zucked, as they say, and getting, not so what would we do? What would all these lively networks of discussion that we cultivate over the last years, thousands of associates, if not all really friends, hundreds of people that you engage with, what would we do if it went down? And out of that, actually, a few people exchanged emails. And one of them was Tim Sheard, who I'd only interacted with occasionally over, over Facebook. I think he like, let me know when he had a new book out or something very didn't know him and never seen his face except for his little icon. And we started a discussion. Uh, we brought in Seren Moodliar and, and my partner, Linda, and we had a, first it was a free conference call.com. That didn't work as well. We went to Zoom and out of that, within a couple of weeks, the show started and we've been doing it for 21 weeks and had, you know, I think thousands of people that have been involved in this in some way or another and, 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 and really made some good friends through it. So anyway, it's just a small example. I wouldn't say trivial one. I think it's quite, it's been quite important to me, but just one example of, right, how like force, instead of like denying that there is a possible crisis, kind of thinking, okay, well, what's our plan B here? Uh, how can we make the most of this instead of just like complaining about what's wrong with the situation? So anyway, I'm sure you have uh, other examples. I'd love to hear from our guests, but other from other folks, this idea of, of seizing opportunity or, or, or approaching crisis with an eye towards the way in which uh, opportunity may be latent within it. Thank, thank you so much, Joe. I would like to open it up to the audience, a last chance, last call, right? We're going to be closing the bar, last call. If you do have a question or a comment, please type it into the chat and I'll call on you and we, we very much like to hear you. In the meantime, Mikhail, if you have any response to uh, what either Joe said or I said, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Well, I mean, I will just say that I can't remember if this is, if I'm getting the words right, but I think that in Chinese, the character for crisis and is similar to the character for opportunity, right? right. And so I think, and actually when, when everything started going down, that was my first place to go. It's like, okay, so what, you know, like, yeah, it's crisis, but what is this an opportunity for? And actually, I, I think the, the solution, like what we are being forced to do is the solution to some things, at least for a while, as we mentioned earlier, you could see the mountains in China, you could see the sky, right? Like you have an opportunity when things break down for new realities, new worlds, new ideas to come forth. And I think, you know, very concretely, I think, um, you know, Kira actually pointed at this and I, I wanted to hear a little bit more. I couldn't think of exactly how to answer, but you know, a lot of us got to know our neighbors for the first time right? Like I had a two-year-old to 
like next door and then another two year old around the corner. And I don't think we would have, we aren't really like, we didn't have circles pass, you know, crossing. And so we started to like have a little bit of a play area, like outside, the kids would just come and play. And that meant we were outside all the time and we watched the flowers grow and we got baby chicks and watched them. Like there was a lot of sociality, which is so vital. It's not like just wasting time, right? It's actually like nourishing us to have connection, to have community in the places where we live. So that's just a very small one. I would also say like, you know, just w w sometimes when we have crisis, meaning even financially or food insecurity, like that is when we need to connect with other people and we start realizing the commons. We start realizing that you know, like your neighbor down the street actually has a lot of extra food growing in their garden and you make a relationship out of necessity, right? Out of crisis. And that relationship, again, I think it all goes back to becomes the basis for like, you know, a deep friendship, a deep relationship, a deep like ability to find one's own power to one, to nourish oneself and one's neighbors, right? And I think I talk a lot about food, you know, I think adults also like reward. And I think that you know, that's one of the places I've been artistic or creative is like being able to cultivate things with less, you know, and like having the game of like, how can I prepare this with less? You know, I don't, A, I don't go to the store, but once a week now, because that's what we're asked to do. But also, is tight, you know, like all these reasons, constraints create creativity, right? So there's a lot of ways to answer that. But I would say that this crisis is an opportunity to rethink our lives. One of my students' moms was a corporate in the corporate world and just like realize when she was forced to stay home, how much happier she was <laughs> not having the nine to five grind. You know, there's a lot of different examples. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. There's, it's opening our eyes in some ways uh, to possibilities that perhaps we hadn't considered for ourselves. That's what a crisis can do. And I know I'm 72 and I never thought of myself as a songwriter. But in the last two months, I've written like a dozen songs and it's just, I'm shocked, but they bubble up. And there's something about this period where it can release uh, creative endeavors in us if we're open to it. And it doesn't have to be good, right? It doesn't have to be Del Bob Dylan level or whatever, but just that we, that we can express ourselves uh, and have this release. Uh, we have two questions uh, posted on, on the chat. So I'd like to call on first, a Chica, I think it is Chica. Uh, if you'd like to pose a question and then after Chica K Hall, I'd like to hear your question and then we'll ask our, our guests to speak to them. So uh, Chica, uh, Dell, would, would you go first? Yes. Um, so I'm actually really glad that you all brought up the concept of embracing opportunities. Um, my question was more, so I'm a, I'm a college senior. I'm actually one of um, Dr. O's students. Um, my question is, how do you go about, especially during this pandemic, I, I'm very aware that we're in the middle of a pandemic, that this is unprecedented times, yet I'm, I get this feeling um, and this idea that when we, I guess, return to some semblance of normal, the, the world or more so the Western world is going to start like picking up and it's like you should be already like, like, oh, everything is over. You should be caught up now like you it's like you should be doing something like productive during this time. Um, and while I definitely understand and appreciate like taking care of yourself and making sure you're seeking new and unique opportunities during this time, do you have like any advice for balancing like taking care of yourself and seeking new opportunities, but also providing like continue with like some type of like structure and formation with like plans you have because the plans are going to change but like you don't want to just throw away the whole plan because this pandemic at some point is going to end and i feel like it'd be naive of me to be like the entire world is going to be like oh even if we've been in this pandemic for a long time we're going to give you all this leeway and leniency if that makes if that makes sense thank you thank you so much chica uh kay you want to also have a comment or a question kay Ah, here, I'm unmuting myself right now. Um, I was sitting on this book about eviction for years. Nobody was interested in eviction. Nobody cared about eviction. Nobody was getting evicted. All of a sudden, it's the hottest topic on the, in ages. I've got a stack of material all ready to go. My agent's like, when is it done? When is it done? We've got to get this out. It's got to be blah, 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 blah. 
And um, let's talk, talk about opportunity. And unfortunately, it kind of fell in my lap like that. And then the other thing I had was that it's, it's also a very dark time in terms of getting along with people. My neighbors are Trumpers. And so we're not sharing food. You know, we hardly even share a hello. So that's having a mic, uh, going under a microscope too. The people that you're just not like-minded with, but that you might be geographically near. And that's becoming more um, startling and profound. And thank you guys. I really, really appreciate you um, coming by today. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Kay. Victor, uh, would you like to uh, respond to any of these thoughts? Yeah, uh, sure. Thoughts? Let me... Um... Let me uh, first address uh, Chica's question because my students asked me, <laughs> as you say, my students asked me similar questions recently. And, you know, I think, um, I think the opportunity, um, you know, because pre-COVID-19, we were dealing with the same issues of racism, black violence, all the crises that are created um, by this administration, the attack on immigrants. Um, but COVID-19, um, has given us a, a deeper level of awareness of these attacks, these crises that we were facing. And it's also um, shown us um, more of uh, what we were misled into believing existed. Like there is no such thing as a safety net. Let's face it, there's no, that's there's, there's why this country cannot be fully have a shutdown like in other countries. It's shut down. In France, the, gov the government in France guaranteed the wages for all every worker during the shutdown. They would, they, the country could shut down because they guaranteed the wages, they provide all the benefits. So that then now they, they're in a much better situation than we are. I just think it, it exposed that there is no safety nets, it exposed the ugliness of individualism, capitalism. Like it just doesn't. It's not the human beings were not made for this kind of system, and then they expose how deep rooted is racism and police violence and you know violence on black communities. So I think when we, when we talk about creating, I'm not talking about dismantling the whole society, but I'm talking about creating that kind of society where we can all have a quality of life and we can all have dignity and respect and we don't have like um a discrep a, a major disparity between the wealth and the poor we can get rid of inequalities and we can really uh because that's been uprooted deeply and and i think social justice activists were good at taking advantage of this opportunity so we're going to create that kind of society where um everybody's going to have be able to live out their purpose, live out this dream, their dreams, and not have to worry about uh, having like jobs with no wages or low wages, uh, having trouble getting a quality of uh, affordable housing. So, so I, think, I think that's why I tell my students, it's not that, you know, you follow your dream, follow your purpose in life, but we're gonna give you a better society from which you can do that. And that's what, that's what, I, that's what I'm looking forward to. We're gonna create, and then, um, you know, I, I live in my in my building. There's a lot of, um, you know, conservative people who are, you know, part, part, part of um, what I try to, you know, but we, we develop like a WhatsApp in my building that we all look out for each other. If somebody goes to the store, they bring back stuff for other people. If somebody has a shortage of some particular item, somebody will bring it to your doorsteps. Um, and so we figure out how to create community and see through whatever political affiliations you have or political views. And I think, because I think that's always important. I think you're always gonna, we gotta figure out a way to um, keep connected, like interconnectedness does not mean that we uh, connect with some people and leave others out. Cause you know, we wanna create society for all, a, a common humanity for all. Um, uh, it doesn't mean I'm gonna embrace their politics but if they need toilet paper and I have extras and if I see that in the WhatsApp, then I'll leave it at the doorstep. So we're creating that kind of community, able to see through whatever political affiliations or political views that we have. Thank you, Victor. And I'd like to also follow up on what Chica, uh, what you were raising and thank you so much for, for bringing it up. Um, 
when when this COVID is beaten, it's finally beaten, and we can go back into our public spaces freely, uh, we don't want to go back to the same world. We don't want to go back to the same system. We don't want to go back to the same values. We don't, we won't. And, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that um, our friend Adam isn't with us tonight, um, but we, ha we haven't talked about any kind of social revolution. What would it take to really transform our society so that, for example, we, we really dismantle the race, the systemic racism in our institutions, in the legal system, in the culture, and so on. Uh, the, and what Victor brought up, the gross inequality, the wealth inequality, and the lack of opportunity. Um, and I think that's something that all of us as activists that we struggle with. How do we get there? How do we make that happen? Or at least how do we move the country a little bit closer toward that ideal that we have? And it's a topic that we're not going to solve tonight, certainly, but I think that it's something that's on our minds and perhaps uh, we'll come back with another show and uh, uh, address this very question about how can we push this country uh, to a more, a more just, uh, a just society? And I'll leave it with McCall. Yeah, I'll just add, and this might be not the answer you want, Chica, um, but, you know, I do think I, early, early on in the pandemic, I wrote actually a response to a different student asking me a similar question. And I said, please don't do, you know, and I think that one of the things we are being asked, right, opportunity, right, like nailed down, not, not wanting to face this, but what does it mean to stop this machine, right? What does it mean to stop this machine, whether we like it or not? And this machine being an economic system that is dependent on none of us stopping long enough to question why we're doing what we're doing. You know, are you making your plans because you don't want to like, because it's a cutthroat world out there and you don't want to be left behind? Or are you doing what you want to do because it is your heart's desire to do that, which you're meant to do in the world? What can you wake up and not not do in the world, right? I want to build a world where that's what we're doing. And we have, a, like Victor said, a basic income or some sort of guarantee that people can do that. And the only way that's going to happen is if we recognize the power we have to not do and to not play the game that has been told to us that that's the only way, you know, that you have to get graduate from college, get the flat six figure salary, get the blah, blah, whatever it is you're being told, right? I don't know that that's what you have, but it's like, you know, you know, the basketball players refuse to play. This is like, what, you know, like the, there's, we can say no and we can collectively say no in different ways and collectively saying no to the sort of like, when it's coming from just like inertia, like you're just doing this because this is what you were raised to do, say no to that. If you're doing, because it's like, like I think your guitar playing is such a great example. It's bubbling up out of you. You cannot not do it. It's just there, then go for that. And I know it's scary, right? Because you know we need to provide for an income. We need to do all these things. And we feel, especially at your age, when you're graduating from college, like you know, we need to prepare for the next thing. And I, I think, I mean, sadly, this is the part I think people might not want to hear is like, we are, on, we are going to be in a very dire time for quite a while, even when it's over, right? Because the economic consequences of this are tremendous, right? And again, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't ask for this, but on the other hand, slowing, shrinking, not growing our economy, there are some good things to it, both for the environment, but also for our souls. <laughs> and, you know, like the idea that you have to work always to know your worth and to get like, is something we need to deconstruct, right? So I know it's a lot to ask of your generation to be the guinea pigs on this, right? Or to be the, the ones that are so brave that you can actually do it. But that's, I think, part of the invitation of the moment, right? Is like, to not do unless it's bubbling forth because your heart needs to do this or someone needs it from you, right? Because service is also really important. Okay, thank you so, so very, very much. We have time for one last question. Linda has a question or a comment, so I'd like to hear from her and then we'll ask for some last words if you care to uh, make them from our guests. So Linda, take it away. Okay, sure. So, um, I have a question about slowing down, actually. I'm actually a big fan of slowing down. And I think my spirit animal is a sloth. Um, but at the same time, I am one of these people who are still lucky to have a job. Um, and I teach at a university. And actually, um, after the pandemic started and classes went remote, 
I feel like things became even more hectic because, um, you know, we had to learn how to teach remote classes. And I felt like I was on Zoom committee meetings all of the time. And so I felt like work life and um, private life were just completely bleeding into one another. Um, and so I'm just wondering, how do you slow down when your work life is so fast paced or hectic? And, um, and those strategies for slowing down, are they, is there a way in which they're just kind of making you more ready to, um, to kind of take on this faster pace? So just real quickly, I know we're in a short time. You know, I, I see it more as, um, um, you know, living in the moment, like cultivating the awareness of the moment. Um, you know, uh, St. Francis was big on, like he, people, you know, walking in contemplation, doing action in contemplation. And I'm also a follower of Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, the Vietnamese Zen Buddhist, like engaged meditation. Like it's really like doing your work with not just the focus, but the awareness. And, um, and I think that's when then moments become, you stress them, they become you know, you actually feel like you're slowing down, but you're not, you know, because uh, one of the pushback I get from my fellow activists is, are you saying we get, we need to do less activist work when you slow down? I, I go, no, I, what I'm saying is do the same kind of work, but do it with awareness of the moments, you know, with greater awareness and not just be so uh, much on autopilot and focus. So that's why I, that's what slowing down means to me. I'll, I'll add and maybe give a little bit of a, I mean, I think this is a site for organizing and I think this is a site for saying no, you know, and saying like, you know, we, and I'm, I, it's, a, it's, it's similar to Chica, right? It's like, yes, there's going to be consequences. There are going to be people that might frown and say like, well, you're not holding. But if, if you start to like have conversations with colleagues about like the conditions of their life, on this fast pace and I completely agree like I was it was it I teach too and it was in I mean it was one of the most intense times in terms of busyness um I think that this is part of what again this is an opportunity for I think of COVID as like a grand revealer right nothing is new we were going too fast before right but people are more able to see the craziness of the system we have consented to, right? And we are consenting. So we have to like figure it out. And, you know, I am a non-tenure track. I am a fixed term faculty, right? So I have a lot of precarity in the sense, like if I refuse, they can easily find another person and just, you know, hire them. But the idea is like, how do we start doing this collectively and having conversations about the toxicity of a workaholic capitalist culture and you don't have to use that language with people that that's they're not ready for it but just like you know pointing that out and i think again like my student's mom i mean the student was like this was like an, an aha moment for his mom and that trickled down to him of like you know she decided to not she doesn't want to go back she prefers to make less money and have more time at home with her family right and these little aha moments are i think people are right for them because of this period right so we just need to like articulate it, you know, and just to say opportunity, I think it was Milton Friedman, and I, I'm going to get this wrong, it's like, it's like, you all oh, there's always crises, it's like, who has the good ideas lying around? I mean, those of us who have been doing organizing, right, for like, refusing to work, or striking, or like, this is the moment to start like, being creative about how we do this, and make like show to more people how relevant and useful it can be right so it's like this i mean to me refusal to work is a really important tool and we have to do it in ways that the most precarious aren't victimized right like we have to protect each other and doing this so i would just say like having creative ways of having conversations to get others to see it and then like refusing i mean it has worked in small ways in my department i will say that and in my faculty meeting so Thank you, Michal. Linda, I'm going to, um, I'm going to turn, turn to our guests for uh, any closing remarks. But before I do, I'd like to remind you of Sheard's rule. No meeting should go more than an hour, right? Because after an hour, pff, productivity is down. So if you hold, hold your meetings to that and you tell, and just say, oh, I have to go. I, 
oh, I have another, I have another appointment. The hour's up. I have another appointment. Um, believe me, it'll help. Um, I'd like to ask our guests if they have any closing uh, comments or remarks. Michal, you go first. Just uh, any last par uh, parting words of wisdom or humor. And um, I, w I won't tell my zombie joke, I promise, if you come up with something funny. Wow, if Victor is ready, I'm trying to think of what my final word would want to be. Um, hmm. I guess, you know, I go through days where I feel like I think I had a couple of these in the last week since UNC's debacle of an opening and feeling so enraged with the administration and the risk they put people's lives at. And then I go through days and having these kinds of conversations where I'm like, wow, like this is truly a moment. We cannot waste this moment, right? Like we cannot waste the opportunities of this moment of everything falling apart. You know, when things fall apart is when new things can grow. So um, we need to like, you know, actually force some things apart maybe in our work meetings and all of these things, but just to really um, take that to heart and take care of ourselves as we do that. Because if you, part of the way I get into the not taking care of myself is to get into that work grind, right? And I'm so productive and I'm so da 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 da. And I then like am distracted from being present in the moment and building the world that I want to build. So again, taking advantage of what we are being faced with in its really uncomfortable, so many uncomfortable dimensions. Like I am not a fan by any means, and I'm grateful. I'm truly grateful for all that I've learned and all the things I see like maybe like are latent and can be watered. I really love that Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, he's like, choose the seeds you want to water, you know, like it's, they're all there. You got to water the seeds you want, right? Like water them. Take the time. Thank you, Victor. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Um, you know, I I think there is joy in the work of activism. I, I when my class had taught this summer, we used the book. We read the book of joy by the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. And the whole book, they talk about all the different emotions that you go through: crisis, uh, suffering. But you know, there is a joy. You know, I I. For me, it's about daily living, and I wake up in the morning, and I know I have my my health, my body, my ability as an activist to do. I have another day before me to do the work for justice, to find the opportunity in a crisis, to give compassion, and to also be kind to myself. Every in the evening, I I have my instruments from Peru, and I have my in my balcony. I have my celebration in the evening, right underneath the moon and the stars. And it's an evening to celebrate that I had another day. Um, and then next morning I wake up and I have another day. So I just think there is, we just have to stop and pause and find the joy and the opportunity in the crisis. And that requires us sometimes to go inwards. And, you know, for me, it's prayer, meditation. It might be uh, writing or poetry, or it might be uh, something else, but but we, we, we owe it to ourselves to find the joy in this kind of work. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Well said. And thank you so much for taking part and giving us so much of yourself, Victor. And Michal, thank you also so very, very much for joining us on this conversation. I hope that you'll come back another time. We have um, Joe will be introducing our next show. And we're, and then we're going to be going to twice monthly uh, starting in the fall. So I hope you'll uh, be able to dip in once in a while and join us. And we'd like to hear you know, from you again and hope, hope that we see you again. So uh, that's my part. Joe, you want to take away and lead us into next week? Sure. Thanks, Tim. Thanks again, Mikhail and Victor and everyone who contributed to, to, to tonight's really, I think, really uh, moving and uh, grounding conversation. Yeah, Tim, you, you stole my transition line. I was going to say all this talk about slowing down has got to us at Shelter and Solidarity. We're gonna go bi-weekly as the semester starts for many of us. Not next week, next week we'll, we, we will be back 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a theme that hopefully today's grounding reflection has prepared us for. The theme of next week's show is Know Your Enemy, Grasping the Nature of the Right-Wing Threat. We will be joined by three terrific speakers scholar activists who have been studying and engaging in political practice uh, around the, some call it the neo-fascist currents of our, of our current moment, 
some call it right-wing authoritarianism, right-wing populism. We'll be joined by Bill Mullen and Chris Biles, the co-authors of the brand new U.S. anti-fascist reader, an anthology from Verso Press. Uh, that's Chris Viles and Bill Mullen, and also by Bill Fletcher, who's I think who has joined us a couple times on Shelter and Solidarity, which I guess makes him a regular. Uh, we'll be having a rich conversation, and we invite you all to help us enrich it. As always, here on Shelter and Solidarity, unlike many webinars that are blasting you with mostly one-way information, we invite you into dialogue every week here on Zoom, on Facebook Live, and eventually on YouTube. We appreciate all the support you can give. We don't have a lot of multi-million dollar um, resources to spread our, our work, so we encourage you to invite your networks and share the content and subscribe to the YouTube page and, and share your own ideas about shows and guests. Maybe you yourself would like to be a guest. Uh, we are open to all of your suggestions as we create this, this show as we go. We walk, create this uh, road by walking it, I guess, making it. Uh, making it by walking. Okay, I want to thank uh, not only our guests, Mikhail Osterweil and Victor Naro, Tim Sheard for leading uh, us today, but also our sponsors, Hardball Press, a publisher of working class stories, uh, Socialism and Democracy, a very important journal uh, for a uh, research journal for activists, as we often refer to it. Also, Encuentro Cinco, an organizing hub in downtown Boston, and our new co sponsor, Community Church of Boston, which we're really happy to have on board. Uh, thanks also to the production team, Seren Mudliar, Tim Shear, Linda Liu, Kira Mudliar, and everyone else who's helped to make this show happen. I hope to see you next week. And until then, be grounded, stay safe, but engaged, uh, and find the joy in this struggle. It's going to be a long one, but we are not alone in it. Take care, everybody. <laughs>